You know, in a lot of churches, I've noticed this pattern. I've been, uh, you know, different churches over my time, and I've noticed that on Mother's Day, the church is usually full. It's usually full, wide open. I mean, because what moms do, they, they, they're saying, what do you want for Mother's Day? I want you to come to church with me. They, they tell them, and they bring them to church. And then on Father's Day, for some reason, uh, a lot of times we don't see it. The fathers go out, they go fishing or go do something, and I'm just glad to see you here this morning. Glad to say you didn't skip out on Father's Day, but you're here to, to worship God and be with other Christians. Amen? There's nothing better than that. Everything else will leave you empty, but I believe you're going to leave with something this morning. Turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 4. And I want to talk to you about Father's Day, and, uh, or, or, or rather talk to you about what the Bible says about being a father, and just some things that are on my mind and heart about being a dad. And of course, this isn't going to necessarily apply to everybody in here. I realize that. Not everybody has kids, and then of course, some people are uh, not dads at all. They're moms, or some of we got single moms. We've got all kind of people in here this morning. But... You know, I believe that, that God has a word this morning for fathers. And uh, if you'll listen to what the Word of God says, I believe it'll help you and that it'll impact you this morning. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 4. Paul is giving Timothy instruction on what he should look for in a pastor, uh, in putting pastors over churches and putting people in leadership in churches. He's giving him instruction on what he should look for. And he says, the, the person you're looking for, this is one of the qualifications, verse 4. He says, he must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, then how will he care for God's church? So what he's saying is the home is really a test for leadership. He says, if he can take care of his wife, if he can manage his household well, if he can keep his children in order... Then he says, then that's going to be one sign that lets you know that he's probably ready and able to lead in the church. On the other hand, if he doesn't have a good marriage and he doesn't have a good relationship with his wife and there's bitterness and there's bicker, uh, bickering all the time and there's this constant power struggle and his children are unruly and misbehaving, he said, well, then he's probably not going to really be ready to lead the church of God. So he says, look for this as a as a test. And some of you dads might be thinking, well, that's fine. I mean, I'm not going into the ministry, so what does this have to do with me? Well, because if God is, look, when, when God is looking for a pastor or a leader to care for the, his flock and for his children, he's looking for the best of the best. He's looking for somebody that, that has this down. And I believe that if this is what God is looking for, that whether we're going to be called into ministry or not, that we still should have these principles in our life. Because this is what God's looking for. This is the kind of people that He uses. This is what He wants. And we don't just see this in 1 Timothy chapter 3. We see this in multiple passages throughout the New Testament that God set the man up, set men up to lead their homes, particularly spiritually. To lead their homes spiritually. And we see this in Ephesians 5. We see this in 1 Peter 3, 1 Corinthians 11, Colossians chapter 3. You can write those down and, and look at it if you want to. We don't have time to read them this morning. But this is the order that God has set up. Now, I understand that this might not be a popular message in the day and age and culture that we live in. Because our culture has by and large rejected God. And our culture has by and large rejected God's thoughts, God's ways, God's commandments on everything from marriage to raising kids to how the home should be ran to what is sin, what is not. So it doesn't surprise me, but what does surprise me or bothers me from time to time or gets under my skin is when I see Christian people adopting the world's viewpoint instead of adopting the Bible's viewpoint. How many of you know that if you call yourself a Christian, you ought to follow the Bible? You know, I, it doesn't surprise me that culture rejects some of the things that we're going to talk about this morning. It doesn't surprise me because that's what they do. They're rejecting God. But you, if you're a Christian, this ought to be your compass. This ought to be your true north. Everything that you hear, that you think, that you feel ought to be filtered through what the Word of God has to say. And if I ever discover, if, I, if I'm ever reading the Bible, 
and I ever discover that I have a thought or a viewpoint that differs from the Word of God, guess what? I have one alternative, I have one option, and that is to submit my thinking under the Word of God and what it says, and to change. But so many people, that's not how they think. They have a viewpoint on life about sin, what, what, sin, what is sin, what is not, what marriage should be, what it should not, and they, they see something different in the Bible, so what they try to do is change the Bible. They don't try to change themselves. They try to change what the Bible says. But I'm going to tell you that for us as Christians and believers, we are to accept the Word of God, not edit it. We are to believe it and receive it by faith with humility and, and submit our lives and our thoughts to it, not try to change it. So with that in mind, talking about this morning, God has set men up in His Word. Again, we, we've gone over this so many times in this church that I, we don't have time to do it this morning, but God has set men to be the head and the leader of, his home, of their homes. That's how God ordained it. That's how God ordered it. Now... I believe that things work best when we follow God's order. You know, have you ever tried to do things your way versus God's way and see how it turns out? Have you ever seen what happens when people reject God in maybe, say, the public school system or in our judicial system? What happens when we reject God's way and go with our own way? It's not pretty what happens. It doesn't always happen overnight. The results are not always immediate, but over time, there are consequences when we reject God's way, when we reject God's order. So I have just discovered that things work best when I just do it God's way. And I may think that, well, it's, you know, it, you may have the tendency, well, this is outdated or we shouldn't be doing that anymore. Things change, cultures change, time, time has changed. Listen, God was right 10,000 years ago. He's still right today. It, it, time, culture, th doesn't change it. He was right then, he's right now. And so I've just learned that if I follow God's way and God's order, everything works out better. I remember there was a time when I didn't think that. Of course, it was a long time ago for me. I was a teenager. For many of you, you, you lived into adulthood without God. But I remember even as a teenager, j trying to go through school and live life and do things my own way, and it was just so much better when I submitted my life to God. And I just realized I was going to do things His way. The, the fruit of it and the results of it was so much better. So much peace. So much joy. So much favor. So much enjoyment of life. And things work better. And I, I just want us to get this this morning. That things work better when we follow God's order. There, we would see such a dramatic difference in the families in, a, in, a, in American culture if we would just do things God's way. But we're not. Many are rejecting God's plan and order for the family, and we're seeing the results of it. I could sit up here and read statistic after statistic, but you don't even need statistics because you can see it with your eyes wide open. You could see what's happened systematically to our youth, to our children, to our families. We're certainly not on a path towards, you know, uh, better and stronger marriages, better and stronger families, better and stronger society. No, no, the morality is going down. The culture is going... It's because we've rejected God. It's, it's, it's simple. It's not complicated. We've rejected God's way and His order. So all I want to get across to us this morning is unknowingly sometimes we can allow the culture's viewpoint on marriage and family to slip into our thinking and how we operate. I guarantee you, there's not a person in this room, there's not a marriage in this room or a family in this room today that's not been affected by it, including my own. It seeps in. And you, that's why the Bible talks about so often that we have to renew our minds with the Word of God so that we think correctly. Because your, your mind, is, is your, your practice is the things that you adopt and do. They're affected by your culture. The devil knows this, and I'm convinced that the devil hates it. He hates it when men are men and women are women. He hates it when men are the men that God's called them to be. He hates it when women are the women that God has called them to be. And, and in our country right now, we have a big debacle over this whole issue. 
We have lots of confusion that is going on right now on this very issue. And, and I think you going all the way back to probably 1960, you could see where the devil began implementing a strategy so that men would not be men, and men would not take their place in the home, they would not take their place in the church, but that these roles would begin to be reversed. And it began with feminism. And you see this going all the way back to the 60s, where basically... God's way began to be rejected and God's way began to be rooted out. Now, I'm going to tell you that I don't believe for one, for one second that God had anything to do with feminism. I don't believe he was involved in it in any way because it's a rejection of God's order. Now, were things perfect? Were things right? D- did there need to be some change in, how, in, in women's roles in the family? So absolutely, I believe there did. But I'm going to tell you this. God would never push down and, and break down one gender while raising the other one up. I believe that both need to be raised up, both need to be, be pushed up, and that it would be a blessing to, to both. But we see that beginning to happen then. We see it today with homosexuality. We see it today with all the confusion on transgender. I was reading something just a few days ago, uh, something now that they're saying, uh, people are saying that they're gender fluid. In other words, they don't know whether they're male, they don't know whether they're female. One day, some days they feel male, some days they feel female, so they're gender fluid. They go in and out, back and forth. Sometimes they're attracted to this person, sometimes, sometimes they feel female, sometimes not. That doesn't just go against the Bible. That just goes against common sense. And it goes against science and biology. But it certainly goes against God's order. But I can tell you this. The devil hates it when men are men, and he hates it when women are women. And you're going to see this happening more and more, this confusion in the genders, confusion in sexuality, confusion where, you know, and, and it, you know, people think it's a small thing. But, and, I, and I, I'm only, uh, let's see, I just turned 33, so I'm still... I'm still a young man, but sometimes by the way that I talk and think, people would think I'm an old man, but it's not true. I I still am young. But, you know, that's why I think it's a big deal that, I think it's a big deal how people dress. People don't think much about it. You know, you see men walking around wearing skinny jeans, tight skinny jeans, and and all this stuff. Well, is there anything wrong with that? Not necessarily in and of itself, but I'm going to tell you this. I believe the enemy's behind it because I believe he wants to bring confusion in the genders. I believe he hates it when men are men and he hates it when women are women. And that we need to embrace our identities, not in what we feel one day or feel the other. We need to embrace our identities and what God has called us to be. And so these things don't just, don't just, you know, hear this, these things this morning and think, well, you know, it's Father's Day, so we're talking about these things. I believe it has a significant impact, not just on your family, but on where America is headed and where our nation is going. And what I want the men to understand this morning is that the call for you to lead your home and lead your family is a mandate from God. All right, let me say that again because I want that to sink in. The call for you to lead your home and lead your family is a mandate from God. And if you serve him, and if he is your creator, then you must pick that mandate up. And you must accept it, and you must follow it. And you say, well, you know, I don't want to be the leader of my home in that way. Let me say it again. It is a mandate from God. Well, my wife doesn't like that. She doesn't think like that. This is a mandate from God. It's not about who thinks it's popular, whether you like it, whether someone doesn't like it, whether the culture, doesn't matter. It's a mandate from God. And the way I think and the way I live is he is my master and I am submitted to him and I am going to do and follow what he's called me to do. It doesn't matter if people like it or don't like it. I'm going to follow what he, it's a mandate from God. You know, I remember a story in uh, 1 Samuel. Um, there, was a, there was a priest by the name of Eli and some of you will be very familiar with this story. There was a priest named Eli, and he had two sons, Hophnius and Phinehas. And he was allowing them to serve in the temple. And they were serving the people of God. And, you know, there are all kinds of rules and commandments about what they were supposed to do and how they were supposed to do it. And they weren't doing it right. Matter of fact, they were ripping the people off. They were very immoral. They were, they were doing things that should never be done in the house of God. And Eli just kept ignoring it. 
and he didn't want to confront it and he didn't want to deal with it because they were his sons and they were older and it was going to be very messy and it was going to be very public and it was going to be just a mess. And he didn't want to handle it. And so he kept putting it off and he kept putting it off and he kept putting it off and finally God appeared to him and he says, because of the way, because you have not, you have chosen to not deal with this situation with, the, with your sons, he said, I'm, I'm stripping the priesthood from you. And he lost everything. And, and Eli was eventually judged because of it, because he had a mandate from God and he put the opinions of his children and being a man pleaser above the mandate that God had given him. And if you're saying, well, I'm not, I'm not clear on, on how you're thinking that I'm supposed to implement this. Let me tell you, Ephesians chapter 5 is so clear. Ephesians 5, 22, that whole passage. Paul explains it to men and he says, Men, you are to love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. In other words, it is a sacrifice. It is the same way that Christ loves us. It is the same way that Christ sacrificed for us, that we are to lead and love our families. But it begins with you understanding and accepting this morning, wait a minute, this is not optional. And I think that's the biggest problem sometimes with men is they go, well, I could do it, I could not. If it works for us, we'll do it. Listen, it's a mandate from God. It's a mandate from God, and everything always works better when we follow His plan and His order. Now, I want to give you five practical things this morning of how you can lead your, your family. And some of these I actually, I actually took from a sermon I preached a few years ago on this topic, but as I was studying and preparing for this, it, was just, it just made so much sense that I wanted to, to bring these up again. But I want to just give you five practical things that you can do to lead your family. Number one, pray out loud. Number one, practical, simple thing you can do to lead your family is to pray out loud. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8, Paul says, I desire that men, I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. So Paul said, I desire in every place that the men would pray. Hey, let the women pray too. Praise God. Let the children pray. But he said, I want the men to pray. I want the men to pray too. And sometimes, you know, women are more verbal and so that, you know, we don't really have too much problem praying and they'll pray and boy, they're good at praying. And sometimes the men get intimidated because the, the women are just so good at praying, you know, and they're, they're eloquent and they're good communicators and they just pray so pretty and nice and eloquent. But listen, God doesn't care about that. I could read you whole, whole chapters where God was, was not impressed by eloquent prayers. God's not about eloquent prayers. Pray out loud. Prayer has made all the difference in my life. Prayer has made all the difference in my family. And I believe that men, first and foremost, ought to lead their families in prayer. And so I think you have to pray out loud. Some men will say, well, I don't like praying in front of people. And I would say, just get over it. You have to. Well, I don't like praying in front of people. Get over it. Let me tell you why. Because it's not if you pray. It's not if you pray. It's do your children hear you praying? Does your wife hear you praying because if not you're not leading them in that you're allowing somebody else to lead in it you have to pray out loud because you're instructing them on how to pray you're raising your children to be men and women of prayer and so when you pray out loud you're leading them in that prayer you go well, well how do I pray well first of all you could pray at mealtime and not just Lord thank you for this food amen you could pray at mealtime. Just take a set time to pray at mealtime. You could pray with your kids before bed. You can pray when they're scared. You could pray when they're sick. When your family hears, and, and Jennifer and I do this, you know, as the pastors of the church, we hear about situations all the time that come up. Somebody will text us. Somebody else will call us. Hey, we got this going on. And, and we'll tell them, okay, we're going to pray about that. And we do our best not to just say, okay, we're going to pray about that and then forget it and never pray about it. 
we try to pray about it. But one of the easiest ways to do that as soon as we hang up the phone or as soon as we get the text to pray right where we're at. And usually our kids are with us. So it's nothing for us to grab, and we don't mention people's names or anything like that, but it's nothing for us to grab the kids and say, let's just pray over a situation right now. Let's just pray together over it, and we'll agree and pray together. I think it's important to pray with and in front of your children. Every one of these things that we're going to talk about this morning, they are part of your responsibility that God has given you to train your children and train, and train your family. So it's not just, well, I don't like to pray or I'm not very verbal or those types of things. It's, it's bigger than that because you have children that are looking at you and you have children that are watching you. And so many times we're communicating things that we don't realize we're communicating because our, our actions speak a lot louder than our words. So in a lot of homes, what's being communicated to children is prayer is something the women do. That is not what ought to be communicated. That's not biblical. We don't see that in Scripture. That's not the pattern we see in Scripture at all. Every one of the men in the Bible were men of prayer. So we don't want to communicate in, to our children, well, you know, yeah, women, that prayer is something the women do. Praise God, prayer is something the women do. They got it right. They're, they're, they're doing it right. But we need to step up in that area. Men need to step up and lead their homes in that, in that area. And every one of these things I'm going to mention as well, the, the husband has a part and the wife has a part. So if the, if the wife just jumps in the prayer the whole time and every time and first and takes the lead on it every time without ever giving consideration to our husband, he will probably just sit back and gladly let her do it. But in every one of these, the, the wife has a role to play as well to help move the husband into that position, to help move the father into that position. And it's not through nagging. It's not through criticism. Not, it's not through those things. But it's just giving that opportunity for him to do that. And then the men, when that opportunity is there, understand it, taking your role and doing what's right. And maybe you're a, a dad in here, an adult in here this morning, and you don't have kids that live at home. This is something that, that dads with adult children can still practice. I love it when my dad prays at, at big family gatherings. He, he doesn't have any kids in the home, but all of us kids are there and everybody's there, and he'll pray over the whole thing. I love that. I enjoy that. Even though I'm the pastor, you know, I'm, a, I'm the son that's the pastor, I don't want to pray. I want my dad to pray. And I think that's important. I think even, even, even men that have grown children can still practice this. Number two, second thing you can do as a father is you can take a day off. I'm not talking about taking your regular day off and spending that with your kids, even though I think that's good too. There's something about when you take a day off because something that you that always takes precedence over them that always is a higher priority than them and you you take a day and you say you know normally I would go into work today but I'm taking this day off just to spend with you there's something that communicates above and beyond just oh we're going to take Saturday and go do this say so, you know I was going into work today but I'm going to take this day off from work just to be with you just to spend with you how many know that would speak to your child it will speak to them when you do that. There's something very special that takes place when you do this. There's absolutely nothing that can replace time spent with, with a child. Absolutely nothing. Not gifts, not money, not teaching them good character, good work ethic. They will respect you for all of those things. They will love you for all of those things. But nothing can replace time spent with a child. There's nothing like spending time spending time with them. And it's in those moments that you are being a father to them. And I believe God will use that. Again, this is something that adult uh, uh, dads with adult children can pr still practice as well. Number three, honor their mother. Honor their mother and show affection to their mother. Again, this is not something that 
You do, you go, well, well, you know, I'm affectionate with my wife in private. Yes, but again, it's not if you're affectionate with your wife, it's are your children seeing you be affectionate with your wife because they need to see her honored and they need to see her being loved on. They need to be, see her being treated like a lady. Why? Because you're training them. So you can't just, you have to be intentional about it. You know, we're not, th- we're not a couple. Jen and I are not a couple that, you know, when I, when I go in for a kiss, she doesn't slap me away. Oh, the kids, the kids. No, they, we want them to see us being, for now we're not gross with it, you know, or anything like that. But we don't try to hide our affection in front of our children. They know that we kiss. They know that we love each other. They know that they are not the center of our home. And a lot of families, that's how they're led. The ch- the, it's, not, it's not Christ-centered. It's not even dad or mama centered. It's child centered. It's, it's whatever the kids want, whenever they want it, their schedule, their demands, their time. And I'm just telling you, that's not how our home is ran. And I don't believe that's how the Bible instructs the homes to be ran. Christ is the center of our home. It's not what you want. It's not what I want. It's not what she wants. Christ is the center. You know, me and Jen joke about that. Well, if mama ain't happy, nobody's happy. Well, you know, fine. If, if that's your attitude and that's how you want to be, but we don't live to please mama. We don't live to please daddy. We don't live to please kids. We live to please God. That's how, we, that's how the family should be run. You know, these, but you see that. Somebody gets mad and they're, they're throwing a fit and they try to get the whole family in a turmoil. One person's upset and now the whole day is ruined for everybody else. That's not how the home is supposed to be ran. And, you know, so you got people that are living that way, but Christ is supposed to be the center, and that has to be demonstrated to your children. One of the ways that you demonstrate godly, uh, being a godly spouse is by honoring their mother, uh, by teaching them how to treat women. You're teaching it to your son, you're teaching it to your daughter. You're teaching it to your son how to be a man, how to be a, a father himself, how to be a husband and treat a woman. You're, tre- you're teaching your daughter what to expect from a man that comes along. And I just have to tell you, in the day and age that we live in, she is going to have a hard time finding it. So you better show her and you better teach her and train her right because she is going, she's not going to find a lot of them around the way that things are going. She's certainly not going to find them if she doesn't find them in church. So that's important. But you have to honor your mother in front of the, honor the, your, your wife in front of the kids, their mother, because it's setting that example for them. Another thing, another reason this is important is because husband and wife are a united team, they're a united front. And when one spouse is disrespected in front of the kids, the, and then we expect the kids to show respect, how many know that's not going to happen? So I can't talk to my wife with disrespect and I can't belittle her and then expect that my kids are going to turn around though and treat her with honor and respect. You know why they're going to treat her with honor and respect? Because they see dad doing it. And, and certainly I have grounds to say, if I don't even talk to your mama like that, you sure are not going to talk to her like that. So we're setting that example all the time. So you can honor their mom. These are just three, these are just some practical things this morning. Number four, this one's big. This one's really big. Go to church. Number four, go to church. Now you say, well, you're a pastor. You want us to go to church. No, that's not the reason. Go to church. Lead your family by going, don't send them to church. Don't send your wife, send your kids. No, go to church. Lead in going to church. There was a study done in 1994. Some of you may have heard this because I've, I've mentioned this before. 1994, there was a study done in Switzerland on the role of fathers in religion. And this is what they were studying. They were, they were studying to find out when children were raised in church or if they were not raised in church, did they become faithful church attenders as adults? This is what they were trying to find out from this study. What does it take for a child to become a faithful church attender as an adult? And this is basically what they study was what happens when the mom brings them to church only, the mom only, what happens when the dad only brings them to church, and what happens when both parents bring the kids to church. Now, before I get into this study, because the results are 
kind of staggering. I want to I I encourage you, if, if you find yourself and you go, well, my, my husband doesn't come or my wife doesn't go to trip me, I bring him by myself. Listen, never underestimate, uh, never underestimate how God can still work with you and your family and God will bless you and your family. This is not to belittle that or, or in any way. You do what you can, you do your best. But it doesn't change the fact that this type of stuff matters. So in this study, this is what they found. When mom attends regularly with the children, only by herself, only one child, this is in Switzerland, only one child out of 50 will end up becoming a regular church attender themselves. That's 2%. When both parents attend faithfully, 75% of children became faithful church attenders. So it went from 2% to 75% when both parents attend church. The most shocking part of the study was that the number did not decrease if dad only attended with the kids. When it was dad only that attended, it still, faithful church attendance still stayed at 75%. Why? It's the way that God set it up. Does, does mom's view not matter? Does mom's opinion not? No, of course it matters. I know many people that gave their lives to God because a faithful mama took their kids to church or a faithful mama prayed for their kids. Thank God for that. And I I don't, you know, I don't even know if this would translate exactly to America the same way it was. I don't know. But I know know this. It matters when dad goes to church. It matters. And of course, the ideal situation is both parents going faithfully leading their family in this instance. When you miss church for a football game, you are teaching your children that it is important to go to church as long as something more important doesn't come up. Or fill in the blank. Fishing, whatever. <laughs> You're teaching your kids, it's a, yeah, church is important and we go as long as nothing else more important comes up. That's not a good message to send. And I'll tell you this, in the day and age that we live in, I would have my, ch- my kids in church every time the doors were open. Because I can tell you right now, raising a child or a teenager in 2015 and beyond is not easy. And it's not getting easier, it's getting more difficult. And I would have them being exposed to the presence of God, to the Word of God, to the people of God, every chance that I get because they are being exposed to the opposite every other day of their life at school and in the world. And it, it has an effect. But if you, get, if you bring a child to church, they're hearing the Word of God. How, does it bless you? Because this happens with my kids, and it's not just because they're, pre- they're, they're the pastor's kids. I love it when my kids come home from church and they're singing some song that they were worshiping back there for the next two days. They're just worshiping their little hearts out, singing it as they walk around the house. Boy, that blesses me. Or when I ask them what they learned in church and they can tell me, you know, sometimes I got to prod them a little bit. Oh, we don't know. And I prod them and then they all start spilling out. They, they're getting it. They're soaking it up. It makes a difference. I would have my kids in church every time the doors were open, and I do, and I'm not just would, I do, because I understand the day and age in the world that we live in. It is, it is getting darker. And if you want your kids to live for God, you need to have them exposed to that. Again, is this something that dads with adult children can still practice? Absolutely. I've seen many times even after children are out of the house, that a a father that will faithfully go to church and invite his kids, that God can use that and work through that. It matters. Finally, number five, actively disciple your children. Actively disciple your children. And let me just tell you this, dads. It doesn't matter if you've been saved for a week or a decade. You can do this. You can disciple your children. And really, dads 
discipling their children and leading their home spiritually is way more important than anything that I'm going to do or that Pastor Jason is going to do or that Pastor Brandon's going to do with the youth. What the dad can do in the life of a child as far as discipleship is 10 times more important than what they're going to get at church, actually. And what we're doing here is what we're doing here is to supplement what you're already doing. And you have to take that responsibility. You have to take it upon yourself. This is my job to make sure that my children walk in the faith, that they know the Word of God, that they have an encounter with God. It's my responsibility to do that. And, I, and God gives you that responsibility. Well, this is one place we find this. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 6, it says uh, God's laying out the law and, and how to share it with your family. And verse, uh, chapter 6, verse 6 He says, And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. So he says, this is something that should be being talked about on a regular basis. He said, when you're walking... You're just out walking, going for a walk. He said, this is something you can bring up. He said, when you're in your house, bring it up. When you lie them down at night, bring it up. When you rise them up in the morning, bring it up. Discipleship is so crucial, raising your children in the faith. Now, a lot of families do this by having like a set time in the week that they do a devotional or something like that. You know, they'll gather their family, say, on Thursday night at 6, and they sit down and they have a a Bible study and a devotion, and they use that time to to teach the kids. There's a lot of merit in that, and I think it's a great strategy, and we've done that from time to time. But really, I think that needs to be in addition to just how you live every day. And the conversations that you have with them every day. You know, our kids know the Bible very well. They know all the Bible stories. They know, you know, lots about the Bible. And we don't really have a family devotion time. Not against family devotions. We do it from time to time. But we don't really have a family devotion time where we sit down once a week and and it's like a little compartment that we, you know, set aside. It's part of our everyday life. I look for opportunities to relate Bible stories. I look for opportunities to relate Scripture. When something happens in their, in their life, when they're being tempted to steal or they're being tempted to treat somebody wrong, I relate it to the Scripture and I say, you know, this reminds me of a story in the Bible and we'll talk about it right then and there. So it's, it's a part of our life. It's something we discuss regularly. You know, sometimes we'll be out on the... In the morning, I'll get up early maybe and I'll be out on the porch and... One of their little fuzzy heads will come out the front door and come sit down next to me, you know, and next thing they've got a question about an acorn or a squirrel or the sun or the clouds. And before I know it, we're talking about God and how He created it. And it's, it's actively discipling your kids. And they need that from you. You don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to be a scholar. You don't have to be a theologian to do that. You can just talk to them from your heart about God and what you know about the Scripture. Now, I want to close this morning by saying this. There are no perfect dads. No one's going to do this perfectly. And, you know, I get up here and we talk about about these things, but there are no perfect dads. And you certainly cannot go back and change the past. You can't go back and and change the way you did things or whatever. But that's why I say in every one of these, can dads with adult children do this? Yes. Even if you didn't do things the way you wanted to do them when you were raising your kids in your house, even even with your adult children, most of these things can still be practiced. So there are no perfect dads. There's no sense in beating yourself up over it and Going, oh, well, I, you know, I didn't do any of those things, or I only did a couple of those things. Well, that, that's not the point. The point is, what can you do today? And, and what, can you, what seeds can you sow differently today and let God use it? Because I, I believe that in this day and age that we're in, this is more important than ever. And I, I don't know if I clearly communicated it or said it this morning, but I, I want you to know that the devil hates what I'm talking about today. He does not want to see men move into this place that God ordained for them to be in. He does not want to see that. 
Because I'm telling you, it would, it would revolutionize the church. It would revolutionize politics. It would, re- it would revolutionize every aspect and every area of our nation if men would be men of God and move into the position that God's called for them to be in. And the devil hates it. He knows it. And so there's so much confusion circulating about it. But guess what? The first thing we could do is live it, and the next thing to do is we can proclaim it. Because we have the, the answers that the world is looking for. 